So far, in the analysis of our compressible waves, we've examined waves that are generated by high-speed flows over objects. These waves are stationary in the object's frame of reference, and thus we use steady-state analysis to derive their governing equations. Now, let's say the shock wave is no longer stationary in the object's frame of reference, and that it's propagating through space. In this case, as the shock wave moves through space at a speed w, it induces motion into the gas behind it, causing it to move with a velocity up in the same direction of the wave. Unlike the case of stationary waves, the properties of flow field are now dependent on the time variable t along with x, the space variable. This is what is known as unsteady wave motion. So now the question is, how can we analyze these unsteady compressible waves? And can we apply what we have learned so far to the propagation of these waves? Let's find out. A classical application of unsteady wave motion is a shock tube. Shock tubes are very important instruments used to understand high-speed compressible flows. They help scientists and engineers to study high temperature gases in physics and chemistry, in the testing of supersonic bodies, and even in the development of high-power lasers. The sod shock tube problem was first studied by Gary A. Sod in 1978. Consider a one-dimensional tube which is closed at both the ends, having a diaphragm separating regions of high pressure, also known as the driver section, and low pressure, also referred to as the driven section. The diaphragm pressure ratio is defined as the ratio of pressures P4 by P1. At T equals zero, the diaphragm is suddenly removed initiating transient dynamics of gases in the tube. The initial jump in pressure splits into the shock propagating into the driven section and the expansion wave propagating into the driver section. The propagating normal shock increases the pressure behind it and induces a gas motion with velocity up. This interface between the gases in the driver section and the driven section is called the contact surface, and it can be thought of as a slip surface. The gases remain separated by the surface, and the entropy changes across it are discontinuous. The pressure and velocity, however, do not change across the contact surface. The expansion wave propagates to the left smoothly decreasing the pressure in region 4. But before we can quantify these shock and expansion waves, we first need to formulate the governing equations for unsteady normal shocks and expansion waves. Let's take a look at moving normal shocks. We can readily derive the governing equations of a moving normal shock by noting that W is the velocity of the gas ahead of the shock relative to the shock and WUP is the velocity of the gas behind the shock relative to the shock. Using these transformation equations, we can rewrite the jump relations previously developed for stationary shocks. For practical applications, the pressure ratio P2 by P1 is used as the basic independent parameter, which is different from steady shocks where we rely on Mach number as the governing parameter. For an ideal gas, we get these moving shock relations. By the way, did you notice that the Huguenot equation is identical in form to the stationary shock? If you think about it, this is expected as it relates the thermodynamic variables across a normal shock and they are independent of whether the shock is moving or is stationary. <laughs>
Using the Huguenoy equations, we can also obtain the relations for density and temperature ratios as shown here. UP is the velocity of the moving gas behind the shock as experienced by an observer in the laboratory frame of reference and is given by this expression. You can see that just like W, UP2 depends on pressure ratio across the wave and the speed of sound of the gas ahead of the wave. How large do you think this velocity of this induced motion can be? Well, to answer that, let's look at it in terms of the local Mach number given by this equation. Now, if we consider the infinitely strong shock, that is, P2 by P1 goes to infinity, we get the following limiting value. This value turns out to be 1.89 in the case of air. Therefore, a strong moving shock wave can even induce a supersonic mass motion behind it, not just a gentle breeze. Another important thing to note here is that, unlike the case of stationary shocks, the total enthalpy H0 is no longer constant across the shock wave. Now that we have the tools needed to analyze a traveling shock wave, let us analyze the expansion wave that propagates into the driver gas. Small amplitude disturbances propagating in gases are also referred to as acoustic or sound waves. Since we assume that these fluctuations are small, we can reduce the governing equations of gas dynamics to a set of linear acoustic equations. Using linearization technique and applying thermodynamic considerations, the equations reduce to acoustic wave equation as shown here. A infinity here represents constant speed of sound. For one dimensional waves, the solution of wave equation can be written in this form. This solution is a superposition of left and right traveling simple waves propagating at the speed of sound along these lines having the slope of plus and minus a infinity in the xt plane. The same form of solution holds for velocity. One important thing to note here is that the shape of the wave does not change with time in the acoustic approximation. This analysis is only valid when the amplitude of the wave is small. In cases where such an assumption cannot be made, the wave can no longer be described by linearized equations. Such waves are called finite waves and have the following characteristics. Firstly, the fluctuations in density, temperature and velocity are large. Secondly, the shape of the wave changes with time. Moreover, any local part of the wave propagates at the local velocity of u plus a relative to the laboratory frame of reference. Therefore, full nonlinear governing equations must be used to describe the wave motion. The complete nonlinear governing equations need to be solved to describe finite waves. Such mathematical solution was obtained by Raymond and Earnshaw almost 160 years ago, and we will summarize its main steps here. Using thermodynamic considerations, density can be expressed as a function of pressure and entropy. This helps us get a new form of continuity equation as shown here. Now, if we add and subtract this form of continuity equation from the one-dimensional momentum equation, we get these two equations. Considering these equations along two very specific lines in the xt planes as shown here, we obtain compatibility equations valid along these lines. You may ask, what's so special about these lines? Well, if you've noticed, along this line, our governing partial differential equation has reduced to an ordinary differential equation. These lines are called characteristic lines 
This is an example of a very powerful technique used in the analysis of compressible flows called the method of characteristics. The paths are referred to as C plus and C minus, and these two ordinary differential equations are referred to as compatibility equations along those characteristics, respectively. One very important thing to note here is that these two characteristic lines, C plus and C minus, physically represent the paths of right and left running sound waves, respectively, in the XT plane. Now, we can easily integrate these compatibility equations along the respective characteristic lines to obtain the Riemann invariants, which can be expressed for a calorically perfect gas using the expression shown here. If J plus and J minus are known at a point in the XT plane, then the velocity and speed of sound can be determined from these equations. Coming back to the analysis of an unsteady expansion wave, let us consider a tube filled with a gas that has a piston at the other end. Now, let's say the piston is withdrawn to the right with a constant velocity u3. This would produce an expansion wave propagating to the left as shown. Considering j plus and j minus are constant along the respective characteristics c plus and c minus, and that regions 3 and 4 shown here are the regions of constant flow properties, we can show that j plus is constant through the expansion wave. Using this, we can get a relation between u and a in a simple expansion wave. We can obtain relations between the local gas velocity and temperature, pressure and density using the isentropic relations. Since the expansion wave shown here is a left running expanding wave along the fan of C- characteristic, which are straight lines through the origin, we can derive the following relation. This equation allows us to calculate the variation of u as a function of x and t in the expansion region. Now that we know how to analyze a moving normal shock and a moving expansion wave, we are fully prepared to tackle the salt shock tube problem. The flow field inside the shock tube after the diaphragm is removed can completely be described by the diaphragm pressure ratio P4 by P1. All the relations follow from our analysis of moving shocks and expansions. The pressure drop across the expansion can be computed using this equation. Since P3 is equal to P2, we get an expression for U3 as shown here. We can compute the gas velocity induced by the shock as shown here. Using the equality between U3 and U2, we can derive an implicit relation for shock strength P2 by P1 as a function of diaphragm pressure P4 by P1. Keep in mind that this is an implicit relation and therefore it is solved using numerical techniques. The expansion strength can be obtained and subsequently all the other flow quantities can be found from shock and expansion relations that we've already discussed. With that, let's wrap up the lesson.